Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all so much. We're, we've, I think we're just getting a few more people into the auditorium tonight, but I wanted to welcome you to Emily Carr, and um, thank you all for making it tonight. I know there's a hockey game, and it's a little rainy, so we're competing with some exciting things happening in the city tonight. My name is Jennifer De Dominicis, and I am the Vice President of Enrollment and Student Services and Registrar here at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. And uh, for those of you watching online, thank you so much for tuning in. I want to start first by congratulating all of you. Well done, very good, you did it. You should be incredibly proud of all of your hard work. It was a very competi competitive year for us and um, many applicants and you have all uh, done incredibly well to be sitting here tonight. And it's great to see that so many of you have brought your friends and family members to support you. You know, coming to uh, school and finding the one that is right for you is a big, big decision. And university is hard work. So you will need the support of those who are closest to you um, while you make the journey to university um, and begin your studies. So next year, this next year is all about engaging with the vibrant community of artists, artists, scholars, designers, and media makers that make up Emily Carr. Tonight, we're here to introduce you to some of these people and to help you answer any questions you may have about what things will be like next year and beyond next year. We've assembled a great team of faculty, staff, and students who are here to provide you with information about what your experience will be like as a first year foundation student. And I want to begin by introducing some members of our academic leadership who are here with us tonight. First, Dr. David Bogan, who is our VP academic and provost, as well as Susan Stewart, Susan, who is our Dean of uh, the Faculty of Culture and Community. And now, uh, to get things started, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Burnett, President and Vice Chancellor of Emily Carr. So, thank you and welcome. Um, I'm delighted that uh, you've come out in such large numbers and, and I'll reiterate what uh, Jennifer said, which is congratulations, it's an amazing achievement. This was a very difficult year to get into Emily Carr and you have made it and uh, you'll never forget it. The beauty of the experience of coming to this institution is not only that it is unique and specialized, but that among the specialized institutions of this kind in the world, we're among the leaders. So if there's 10 to 15 top schools uh, in North America, Emily Carr is, uh, I would say, five, six, seven, eight in that range. And why are we so good? Well, honestly, we have an amazing cohort of students that come to this place. Uh, unbelievably creative. When you see the work just that the foundation year has uh, produced uh, over in the North Building, uh, it, it takes your breath away. But we have fantastic faculty, really dedicated teachers, and extraordinary staff that works uh, devotedly for everyone, and some pretty good administrators. <laughs> um, and that combination bringing together the emotions and feelings of what creativity means, the passion for creating, uh, the involvement with community, that, that is a fundamental kind of DNA of this institution. So you're the class of 2019, and in two years' time we'll move to this, which is a 300,000 square foot campus, one of the first uh, campuses of its kind built in North America, completely and utterly devoted to art, design, and media. Um, an, an extraordinary moment in the history of this institution. We're turning 90 this year, so in September when you come, you'll suddenly see all these signs everywhere as we celebrate our 90th anniversary. Started in 1925 by a group of three people. Um, this building uh, solidifies the presence of Emily Carr University as a major institution, not only in the Lower Mainland, in British Columbia, in Canada, but in the world. And inside its four floors, are the, everything that you see here, but magnified, and most importantly, all new. It's surrounded by plazas and walking areas. It will eventually have uh, a SkyTrain station adjacent to it. 
Uh, it'll have an extraordinary level of involvement with the community around it. It's been designed internally and externally to express the story of creativity itself. So that screen that you see on the side there, that's the box in which we do, uh, we have a black box here called motion capture where we can produce anything from stereographic 3D films to games. And that box, the exterior of it, will have somewhere between 100 and 150 LED screens. During the summer, we can screen films. Other times uh, of the year, we can screen the news. Whatever we want, it's entirely programmable. And that's the uh, interesting thing about this entire campus environment. Everything in it is plug and play. It's built on the principle that creative people like to recreate where they live, where they work. They like to make it more representative of what they're thinking about and what they're doing. So the entire campus is built on a plug and play principle. But it's more than that. A building is nothing if you don't have the people in it. And you're the key to the future of creativity. It, it's a funny thing, you know, governments make uh, weird decisions all the time, as we know. Uh, and one of the great decisions here was uh, a decision to support us. One of the decisions that, uh, that needs to be understood in Canada as a whole is that about 10% of our GDP is in the creative sector. So for the parents who are here who fear the outcome of their, uh, of their children's creativity or are worried, oh my God, what are they going into? They're just gonna fool around with this and that. And I know there's some of you here. Let me assure you that it's quite the reverse. That what 10% of the GDP is billions, not millions. In a trillion dollar economy, it's a significant proportion. And it ranges across every imaginable field that you experience on an everyday basis throughout your life. From the uh, tourist uh, uh, trips that you take where you go to a museum, right through to the television that you watch, to the films you go to, to the objects that you buy, to the ceramics that you may love, it, it goes on and on. So the presence of art in your life is actually far higher, far greater, far denser than you may ever imagine. And it's to the parents here, it's your kids that are going to be the producers of that creativity. And in Canada, uh, you know, the, uh, as we've moved forward and as the, the various provincial and federal governments have begun to understand the importance of the creative economy, they've become actually much more active in trying to support it. So what you see here is not just a building. This is a project. It's an art project, actually, for some of us. A very big art project, $122 million art project. Um, but it, nonetheless, it is a project. And it's a project to create a space where people will feel comfortable, where you'll be happy, where you'll engage with your fellow students, where you'll feel that you have the chance to collectively work on projects together, where you'll also feel much more connected to your teachers. We're hoping, idealistically, for something really spectacular. And I can tell you that the, that part of Vancouver that it's gonna be in, which is just east of Maine on Great Northern Way, so between Maine and Clark on Great Northern Way, that entire area, now with the coming of the St. Paul's Hospital, will change dramatically. And over the next decade, you'll see and you'll be part of a transformation of an area that has been waiting to be transformed for the last 50 years. Very, very significant. It just so happens historically, by the way, that art schools, in general, provoke profound change in cities. So the one other thing I'll mention to you is that this is also a city building project. This is about changing Vancouver and making it very apparent and visible to everyone who lives here that the creative sector is as much a part of our overall genetic makeup as anything else that we do. So uh, I'm waiting for Great Northern Way to turn from a highway into a street. And those of you that drive it notice that everybody drives at 80 kilometers an hour, if not more. And I'm waiting for that moment when St. Paul's, when 2020 completes a significant proportion of its building, uh, when the flats then turn into this exciting area of artistic healthcare. By the way, uh, I, you know, we do a lot in healthcare, and I, I'll just tell you a little story. I was sitting in my office one day, and in walked two people from St. Paul's and said, well, we need help. We're designing the hospital of the future. What can you do? And I said, well, we can do anything and everything. We can help you with the structure, we can help you with the design, we can help you with the thinking, we can help you with the passion. Most of all, we can help you because we're smart. So my final comment is to you that university is, be is about becoming smarter and smarter. And to the parents, beware, because they're gonna get more intelligent and thus more aware. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. So uh, next up, we have uh, 
uh, I will invite Dion Acchiati, Assistant Dean, Foundation, and Gay Fowler, our Foundation Program Advisor, who are going to tell you a little bit about the first year of your student experience at Emily Carr. Thanks, Jennifer. And uh, again, congratulations to all of you here. I'm really happy to see you here, and I'm really glad that you've had an opportunity to see the Foundation Show across the hall. What that show demonstrates is a really wide diversity of approaches of our students and demonstrates the commitment that we have to critical thinking and critical inquiry uh, in our curriculum. To give you a little bit of context in the exhibition across the road, uh, in the main gallery is work that's been self-selected by the students that uh, best represents their efforts and, and work throughout the year. And in the hallways and in the classrooms to the side are examples of some of the um, assignments and curriculum and the work that comes out of those. As you come into uh, Emily Carr, the one thing that we're really interested in doing here is teaching you and working with you to work through ideas and to make those ideas into form. Whether those forms are in the form of pictures, in the form of media, in the form of design objects, but how do you translate all this stuff that you've been thinking about? How do you translate all your questions? How do you translate um, any of the um, things that you've been paying attention to and want to talk about into something that is visually, um, uh, visually manifested. And to do that, we take you through a range of courses, some that are required and some that are elective. Uh, Dr. Kelly and Dr. Vineyard will talk about the academic core courses in a little bit, um, but along with the academic core, we have a range of um, what we call our core studio classes. So there's a core class in design, a core class in visual arts, and a core class in media. And you'll choose two out of those three courses. And what each of these core classes provides you is a, a solid grounding, a solid foundation in the critical ideas, methodologies, and histories of those particular types of practices. Along with that, in your first semester, you take a class that's called Creative Process. And Creative Process is a class where you basically explore in a very interdisciplinary way, how do you think creatively? How do you work with critical inquiry through material form? How do you work with materials and translate them into objects that other people can understand and other people can interact with? And then your final um, studio class in the spring is an elective. And the elective you can take in any area of the school. And we have electives in everything from uh, design to animation to ceramics to printmaking and sculpture and social practice, just to name a few. All of this is then supported by a weekly lecture series called the Foundation Forums. And in the forums, we invite artists, designers, media practitioners, curators, all sorts of people uh, from Vancouver and beyond who have worked in the creative field for a while. Uh, some are Emily Carr alumni, um, some are uh, more, more senior artists from elsewhere, um, to give a sense of what the possibilities are outside in the world. What do people do with this? What do, how do people engage uh, in a creative practice throughout their lives? And with all of that together, we hope that we give you a solid foundation in considering the different ways that you might work with art, uh, design, and media throughout your next four years. Another thing that's really important to keep in mind uh, at Emily Carr is that everyone who works here, who teaches in your studio classes, is also a practicing artist, a practicing designer, or a practicing filmmaker, animator, etc. And we're all deeply committed to this artistic practice that, that we've chosen. And what we're hoping to do with you is to really kind of work with you to um, give you a sense of how you can work with materials, how you can, you can use materials to uh, engage the world around you, how you can um, use materiality in order to realize your ideas, and that with everything that we do in our classes, we always go through a process of making and then reflection. So we make things, we think about them, we talk about them, we critique them, we question them, and then we make more things. And all of this together forms the studio component of your foundation year. So that was just a very brief introduction to what you might expect in the studio components. Um, and again, I'm really excited to see you here, and I really hope that I get an opportunity to work with you over the next few years. And uh, now I'm going to introduce Gay Fowler, who's our um, foundation program advisor. Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you, Deanne. Um, and uh, again, welcome, families and uh, students, potential new students. It's really nice to see you out. I know the game's on and I didn't expect to see as many fathers here tonight. <laughs> uh, Anissa, are you putting up my slides? Oh, no, it's me, I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Right, there we go. Oh, no, these aren't your slides. Anissa is gonna get your slides. Okay, well, um, <laughs> I'll introduce myself. Uh, 
My name is Gay Fowler, and I'm the Foundation Program Advisor, which um, doesn't really describe my job and what I do. Um, I work, I have a very close relationship with the Foundation students um, as I help transition them through their first year of university. And their first year of university is, um, so, sorry, I'm getting distracted by this, um, is not only a time when they're uh, growing as uh, young into young adults, many of you are right out of high school, but they're also becoming, emerging as the artists that they're going to become. So I'm having a, a technical difficulty here. Any sign? Thanks. Is it off um, loop? Mm. Sorry about that. Um, anyways, uh, my job is really rewarding. Uh, the unique thing about foundation, uh, as opposed to any other year at this uh, university, is that uh, upwards of 375 of you will be accepted into first year, and it's the only time in your academic <clears throat> career here that you'll actually work together as a group, multidisciplinary. You, in second year, you'll go off into your majors, but in first year, you get to cross-pollinate, meet all the people, define your groups, and um, move forward in that exciting time. <clears throat> You know, I should have done this the way I did it last year and it really worked. <laughs> um, I'll tell you a few things about orientation. Um, it is happening this year uh, uh, between September 1st and September 4th. You'll be getting lots of information on uh, email about it. Uh, the uh, first day is going to be an assembly where we're gonna gather you here. Can I just scroll through now? Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, it is going to be um, an orientation where we're gonna get, gather you all together. It's an assembly day. We're going to have you meet key administrative, uh, key administrative personnel here. You'll um, have probably a keynote speaker as well. You'll be able to um, uh, get together as a large group. We'll bring you over, get a big group picture of you. Um, we'll have a, the Students Union is going to host a, um, a social get together. They call it a barbecue, but it's a grilled cheese event. And, um, uh, and um, we'll um, uh, invite you to attend the info tables that we're, we'll have set up with. And, um, and we really encourage you to go to those because there's a lot of information there for you. So we get you here and cram you together because until we get that lovely new campus that Ron Burnett and many others have worked really hard to get for us, um, we're going to probably break every fire code and mush you together there. Um, during orientation week, we'll do a series of workshops and one of the favorite ones we have is a graffiti workshop that we uh, do with the students. Um, it's led by a quite renowned graffiti artist, and um, like I can't even say his name because it's like a squiggle and a star or something like that, but um, he'll be leading it, and um, it's a workshop that the students really like. We get you working together in big groups, and you get to meet everybody, so everybody has the same fears in the beginning, but we help. As you can see, we put you together, and um, people love the workshop, as you can see. Um, the works that you make go up on display, and we make buttons with them or do stuff with them, depending. Um, we'll also, during or, uh, orientation weekend, all through the month of uh, September and into October, everyone will be doing a safety demo. It's because we have a, a technology shop in Foundation, and that's where you'll be able to learn how to use a whole bunch of power tools, uh, casting, mold making, there's demos and all kinds of things, and it helps you start on your um, uh, artistic career. So in the shop, you learn things like um, how to breathe through straws, <laughs> and you need a demo for that. Um, I'm not able to forward this. Oh, it's uh, Annie said slip to something else here. <laughs> well, there's something else you'll learn here. Um, there we are. Uh, how to give the safe signal of thumbs up that you're still breathing through the straw and uh, how to have your face removed to safely. Um, so those are our technicians, Megan and Sean, who everyone will work with really closely when they go into um, the shop. 
Um, so we also have in foundation, we're situated in what's called the Faculty of Culture and Community, and um, my office takes community building really seriously. I work with foundation students to do a bunch of social activities on campus, and um, we organize this through what we call, excuse me, <clears throat> the Awesome Committee. And all you have to do is sign up for that committee and you are all awesome, and that's how that works. So the Awesome Committee puts on a variety of events. We'll do a button-making workshop where you design and make, and we stamp them out right on, um, on the spot, and then you trade them with other people. Um, we'll do uh, our monthly coffee nights, uh, which are really popular. Uh, they have an open mic, so start practicing your ukulele. And um, lots of people get up and perform. Uh, there's such a diverse group of people, we really encourage um, uh, ex uh, sharing your background and community with us. Um, these people at Coffee Night were demonstrating um, Argentinian tango. Um, every year we honor and recognize Nehru's or Persian New Year, so we set the table with the traditional wares, and we have students who will perform traditional Persian songs. Um, these girls are singing Venezuelan folk songs. Um, we have done a uh, day of the dead and uh, we, this was fantastic. We did a week of workshops where we learned how to make the traditional paper flowers that you see there. Um, we did the whole procession and set up an altar and we learned uh, that the empanadas on the altar are not empanadas, they're fake. <laughs> um, we, uh, there's our graffiti guy who can't get away from it. Even on Halloween, he dressed up as a graffiti spray can. Um, but uh, we also do a couple of big events every year, one, uh, one being the um, Halloween party. And as you can imagine, as uh, at an art school, the costumes are pretty great. We have fantastic prizes. And um, I mean, you're dancing next to deep sea divers and zombies and, you know, I don't know what the yellow balls are, but uh, so we, they really go for it. We have a great time. Does anybody know who that is? Do you know who that is? I'm Groot. Yeah, yeah, Groot. Um, he wins costumes every year and up. We have people come. They really go at it. This is to prove your, your art history education is not going to be wasted. You'll be able to talk about that <laughs> at Halloween. And uh, she was funny on the end because by the end of the night her eyes were all over the place. So she was. Um, we our sun maiden. It's completely made out of duct tape. So the prize winners that we have are clever, not just um, buying pre-made, as you can imagine. And um, this is an industrial design student who decided to make um, one of these models. And I don't know who's going into design, but it's a fairly competitive area. And um, this is what showed up the second year and also a design student. <laughs> so um, we have a full animatronic, so he wasn't going to be outdone. Um, we have, this is, I keep putting that picture up because it's the last time I had time to get a haircut, but um, it's Sean, Megan, and myself. There's also Willow who works in our department and that makes up the foundation department that is here to support you. And as you'll find with everybody who gets up here and speaks, speak, we are all here to Ha make you have a successful time while you're here developing your art practice. Um, I'm a real cheerleader for the university. I've worked here for many years. I've taken classes here. I really love it here. And you students and watching you develop as people is what makes me get up in the morning and feel happy about coming into work. So um, I, I really love foundation, um, but it's enough. It doesn't mean anything to hear it from me. Um, I've got a few slides. If when you go over to the foundation show across the road, and I strongly encourage you to do that, you'll notice beside all the artworks is the label of the student, and beside it is a 50-word statement, um, 50 words or less. And in that statement, students are trying to summarize their year, uh, their first year of university in the foundation department. And I'm going to do the thing that I, I hate when anybody else does it, but I'm going to read as I put it up there. Um, in my foundation year, I've had the opportunity to study with many talented people. I'm happy to be here, and I've challenged myself beyond my limits. Never has my life been so dependent on free food. <laughs> <laughs> I feel happy when I wake up in the morning and realize that I'm learning what I really want to learn and becoming what I really want to be. 
I realized I came to the right school when I could go an entire day in a toga without anyone lifting an eyebrow. <laughs> and he really did that. Um, your life divides into two, before and after you attend ECU. I love everything about the school. Talented classmates, learning environment, caring staff and faculty, location, and a small, fantastic community. So that really sums it up. I attended ECU and all I got was this world-class education. <laughs> Um, so the foundation show is across the road. Again, I really encourage you to do that. That's one of the final culminations of all our efforts that we put together. It's a very strong show this year. Um, if you can, please pop by there. And I look forward to getting to know you and getting out of bed because I do know you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gay. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Trish Kelly and Dr. Deirdre Vineyard, uh, who teach the academic core for the foundation year. Thanks, I hope we're gonna do the slides again. Yeah, we're gonna try. We just need to switch back to the other deck. Just there you go. Yeah. Okay. There, oops, something. almost. Something's happening. Okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> Great, well, to start before my slides are up, I'm an art historian, so I always love it when I have a slide there to throw your attention away from me. All my students can tell you that. Anyway, my name is Trish, and I get to, I have the privilege, I'm um, the only faculty member here at Emily Carr who teaches all first year students. So I take that really as a privilege. And while my classes are really large and I don't get to know everyone, um, in the same way maybe I would if I had a class of 20 people, it really is a privilege to work with everyone here and to participate in helping you frame your education, as particularly as you're starting off. I'm gonna speak today, myself and uh, Deirdre, about the academic core, which is a six credit, uh, part of your six, it's a six credit course, part of your foundation year curriculum that really brings together a lecture and seminar format to help you engage and expand your visual and verbal literacy. In the lecture portion of the course, which is what I do, you're gonna look at images and objects both contemporary and historical, in order to learn to deconstruct the very complex social, political, and cultural context that influence their making. So for example, we'll consider artists like um, the, the contemporary Chinese artist and book designer Xu Bing and his book from the sky, which you see here, to consider how signs convey meaning through shared communication. Here, Xu created over 4,000 unique Chinese characters that look readable to an audience. They look like readable language. In fact, they even look at important text, scrolls, hand-printed books, but which were completely made up by the artist as a sort of absurd communication and not understandable to anyone else. Or we'll discuss issues of identity and how that's negotiated through cultural production in the work of artists like the contemporary Canadian artist, Brian Jungin, who's actually a, gra a graduate of Emily Carr. In this piece, Jungin explores his Aboriginal identity through his interest in cetology, a branch of marine science concerned with the study of whales, important to Jungin's First Nations culture. On the other hand, it also calls up a broader notion of Can Canadian identity. Here I'm showing you a detail of the work, and you can see it's entirely composed of plastic long chairs, all bearing the price tag from Canadian Tire. <laughs> the point is to really understand how cultural products, images, and objects communicate to their audiences, and how they're, that, that's particularly important to all of you as makers but also to recognize how this changes over time and how new publics learn to appropriate and interpret representation. So for instance, you may be familiar with Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. This is the centerpiece of it, which was produced in the 16th century. But here, it's reused by a contemporary um, 21st century plastic surgeon, encouraging you to be born again by pressing the elevator button to go to that floor. The point in all of this is really to understand that when we look at work produced by diverse cultures at various historical moments, we have to engage ourselves in understanding those contexts. It's complicated and necessary as you move forward as designers, media practitioners, and visual artists. 
And as we move through the course, you'll really come to understand the legacy of cultural production that you're inheriting and how it has a social and political potential that you'll really learn to groom and to shape as you will. So now Deirdre's gonna talk, I'm talking here just about the lecture portion, Deirdre's gonna talk about your seminar portion of that academic course. Good evening everybody, it's great to see you. Um, as Trish said, I'm gonna talk about the seminar portion. You will all be in small classes, 25 students each, where you can take up these ideas. Um, um, take up the ideas of how we look and analyze and understand, and then we're gonna add the dimension of written text, reading and writing. So we learn that looking at text holds much similarity to the act of viewing objects. We analyze writing for meaning in similar ways that we analyze objects for meaning, considering always the context in which it was created. So specifically in the seminar, we will explore the ways of reading and writing serves us at the academy and in art and design. We will read a wide variety of forms, such as art writing, scholarly articles, memoir and theoretical and historical work to understand the art, media, and design that we are engaging with. We will examine ways that we can fully interact with difficult writing. We will do a variety of writing assignments, including narrative pieces, formal analyses, inquiry-based essays, and reviews. As we practice these forms, we will always be conscious of how we are situating ourselves in our own writing and how our writing speaks to our audiences. Thus, the writing course is a process-based course with a rhetorical focus. We teach writers to understand their own writing process, to understand what accomplished writers do, which is drafting, conferencing, reading, and rereading. And we teach students to understand that all writing is rhetorical. In other words, all writing makes an argument to a particular audience and is created to take action in the world, just as the images that Tris has shown you are created to take action in the world. Writing does the same thing. We recognize that looking, thinking, writing, and analyzing are critical skills in any discipline and any profession. This academic course and its connection to your studio courses provides the framework to develop you as cultural producers. We believe that artists and designers don't just reflect their social moment, they make it. Thus, this course sets you up, sets you students up to achieve this in critical and creative ways. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, now I'd like to introduce Chelsea Hug from uh, Continuing Studies, who's our manager of operations. And she's here to talk to you a little bit about a program that we have to help you transition to Emily Carr called the Welcome Lab. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk to you guys about a program called Welcome Lab. Uh, Welcome Lab is a relatively new program for us here at Emily Carr. And it was really created um, to help students transition from where they were, whether it be high school or, or elsewhere, into um, art and design university education. So it's a, a one-month program that runs in the month of August, so right prior to the start of foundation year. Um, it runs for the whole month, Monday to Friday, five days a week, um, nine to four. So it is an intensive program for the month of August. And it's a... Um, through this program, you're able to gain three credits towards your foundation year. So it's really set up to enable students to gain familiarity with both the academic portion of foundation as well as the studio um, while gaining familiarity with Emily Carr um, and its location and facilities prior to starting foundation year. Um, as you see, everyone here is super supportive of you in your foundation year and, and are really wonderful and, and teaching you a lot of new things, but it is it can be quite overwhelming for students. It's, it's very new, as you see. It might be quite different than an education that you've had in the past. So this program it was really built to help to students come here, have a more intimate, uh, intimate experience in a small classroom with their instructors, and really set them up to be ready in September to jump right into foundation and all its um, wonderful challenges and experiences. So the program is, um, as I mentioned, it, it is bearing three credits. And it's made up of two components. 
Uh, those components are an academic skill, and this um, portion of Welcome Lab will help students to um, improve their both writing and reading of academic um, focused texts and materials, and will focus on a vocabulary that is um, very tied to art and design and the critique process as well. Uh, the second portion is a studio component, and it's uh, called Video Essentials. And through this course, students will um, create and work in the studio environment, become familiar with um, their, the idea of in-class discussion, in-class critique, um, the idea of making work, speaking about it, um, and, and working in that collaborative environment. Um, and so this is really an ideal program for both students that are um, coming in and maybe wanting to improve on some academic skills or are really just looking to have an experience where they can get started at Emily Carr a little bit early, get a head start, and really move successfully into foundation uh, right away and be sort of ahead of the curve. So um, we have information on the website if you're interested in the program. Um, the admission advisors can also speak to people um, if you are speak to people about the program if, if you're interested in coming to Emily Carr a little bit early and getting a head start on everybody else. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Chelsea. So uh, we are almost uh, to the part where you're going to hear from, well, from our students, uh, which will uh, give you a better understanding of uh, the student experience from the ground. But I do want to take a moment to introduce you to our team in student services who are here with me tonight. Um, and in student services, we're here to help you reach your educational goals. And we offer resources and programs to support your experience at Emily Carr. We offer a range of supports to help make your transition to Emily Carr smooth, and um, s some of the team in student services are here tonight, um, uh, will also be available following the conclusion of our activities in the auditorium, out in the atrium, to answer questions for you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So um, from recruitment and admissions, and some of these people you've talked to along the way while you were applying or putting your portfolio together, with, uh, with us here tonight are Kevin Bird. Kevin, where are you? Back here, okay, he's in the darkness, all the way at the back, Kevin Bird. Um, Joni Taylor, who's been a huge part of organizing tonight's event. Thank you, Joni, for all your work and putting this together. April Milne, and Sam Barron is in the booth answering questions online. He's come out to wave, very good. Um, from r records registration and advising, we have Denise Cordry, Danielle Zanvliet, Kimberly McElroon, uh, Alex Fowler and Otilia Spantulescu, who are all here and will support you through the, the uh, registration and advising journey that you will experience over the next few years of your studies. Um, from financial aid and awards, Sharice Bryan, Polly Liao, Carmen Chan are here. And from counseling access and student development, we have Amy Kiong, Emma Smith, Johnny Liu, and um, Yes, very good. And is Heather still here? Heather? No? Yes, you are. There you are. Very good. Heather's still here. She hasn't got on the ferry just yet. And uh, student development advisor, uh, Justine Gabias, who's going to moderate our student panel momentarily, so you'll hear more from her. And finally, last but not least, Brenda Crabtree, who's our uh, Aboriginal program manager and who, again, will be available in the atrium. But uh, she has the best location on our current campus. So be sure when you become a student to make your way to the Aboriginal gathering place and uh, see the water. It's one of the only places uh, on our campus presently where you can get a sense of where we are in Vancouver. So uh, I just want to take a moment um, and um, remind you all that the acceptance deadline is fast approaching next Friday, May 1st. So if you haven't already had a chance to accept your offer, please do so. Finally, Justine Gabias will come up now and introduce the outstanding student panel we've assembly, assembled for you uh, tonight. So you can hear firsthand about um, our wonderful students and their experiences at Emily Carr 
And um, you'll also have an opportunity at the end to ask questions of your own, not only of our students, but David and Susan um, are here to also answer questions and we have portable microphones for you both. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello, everybody. And a second, I get my karaoke song, please. <laughs> joking. Um, hi, everybody. What a treat. I'm so excited to see all these fresh faces. It's really wonderful every year to see not only the new students who uh, or potential students, but also all the support that you guys have, whether it's uh, family, friends, partners. So thank you for being here. This means a lot. And it's so nice to get to see the people we're going to hang out with next year. Um, my name is Justine. I am the Student Development Advisor. But I'm also a grad from Emily Carr. So I graduated in 2010 with a Bachelor of General Fine Arts. So for all you parents out there, yes, I am proof right here that you can get a really awesome job after graduating from art school. And there's actually a lot of us uh, in student services who have graduated from Emily Carr. And we just can't leave. We just love it so much. So there you go. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, present to you my wonderful panel uh, of current students so from a variety of disciplines, year levels, and corners of the globe. So I'll let them introduce themselves. And what we're going to do is they're going to introduce themselves. I have some simple questions for them. So let's pretend we're in the living room and everybody's just chilling and it's great. Um, and so they're going to talk to you about their experience. And then afterwards, if any of you have questions for them or, or for David Bogan or Susan Stewart, then you can ask them, or for me, maybe, I don't know. Um, and, then, um, and then we'll be done. So you're almost there, but this is the fun part. Okay, guys, introduce yourselves. Hi, uh, my name is Alia Hijab Abayid. I'm a Syrian American student. I moved to Vancouver just last September, so I'm like pretty new. And uh, I just finished my foundation year, and I'm going into the animation program major. So. Uh, I'm Salguero. I'm, I'm from uh, Southern Ontario. Uh, I'm in the uh, Critical and Cultural Practices program and going into my fourth year. Uh, hello, everyone. My name's Joachim, or Yoki for short, and as most people know me. Um, I just finished my first year here, and I'll be going into uh, interaction design. And uh, I moved here from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Joey and I just finished my foundation year and I'm going into industrial design. Uh, I was born in Vancouver but I grew up in Asia and I came back a couple years back uh, just to finish schooling here. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Denise. I was born and raised in Turkey and then um, I moved to Vancouver two years ago to attend Emily Carr. I'm in animation. Aren't they beautiful? I also want to point out <laughs> how well dressed everybody is today. I was really impressed looking at people coming in. I was like, oh my God, I feel like oh. <laughs> underdressed. Um, all right, so first question, pretty general, but you know, maybe tough for some of you, but why did you decide to come to Emily Carr? Maybe we'll start with you, Alia. Um, well, I first learned about Emily Carr from a teacher I had, and I was looking at universities in North America in general. And she said that her husband had gotten Emily Carr, and I looked it up, and I really liked it. And um, I mostly liked that it was a small university community. Like, I was looking for that in terms of, like, just how I learn. It's like I find it more helpful when there's uh, smaller classes and, like, universities in general smaller. And I also loved the idea of Vancouver in terms of what I want to go to uh, animation. There's lots of uh, action here in, like, film and stuff. So that's what made me really interested in Emily Carr. Three reasons. Uh, the first one, I'm the oldest of seven siblings, and this is 3,000 kilometers away from them. Uh, uh, the second was a really good National Portfolio Day experience, uh, uh, and that saved me quite a bit of the registration process. Uh, the third reason being that they seemed way cooler than OCAD. Um. I would, I would definitely agree with Alia that I was just looking for, for a, a smaller university. Um, so I'd moved here from Alberta, as I mentioned, and uh, I felt like I really just needed a change of scenery. So the coast seemed like a good place to go. Um, and I was really looking for, um, I suppose, a, a denser uh, cultural community, really. Um, I wanted to find like-minded people. so. I, I chose Emily Carr, that's why, yeah. 
Um, for me, I've always wanted to come to Emily Carr, and um, I actually transferred from another university, and I wouldn't say I had a terrible experience, but it just wasn't the right fit for me. So I applied, and I got accepted, and after that, like, I cried when I got my letter. I don't know if some of you did, hopefully not. Um, but yeah, once I got accepted, I got, um, like this new confidence in myself, knowing that I can actually do this. So I accepted the offer. Um, my university advisor was Canadian, and um, the first university uh, she ever talked to me about was Emily Carr, and they had an animation program, and Vancouver is pretty known for its um, animation industry. So this was the perfect fit for me. Animation fans here. <laughs> Well represented. <laughs> Great, awesome. And Alia was talking about class sizes, and I'm sure you you know already. Studio classes are capped at 18 students per instructor here, so those are really small, wonderful, you know, like little nucleus. So you can have like great one-on-one -on -one time with your instructor. You can get to know your classmates very well. So that's a really big plus. That's what I I really liked that when I was a student here. So. Keep that in mind. All right, so next question. So now we've talked about the past. Let's talk about the present. So how are things now? Like, how is your experience right now? So you, we've got three uh, students who just finished their first year, and then we've got Sal's going fourth year and Dennis in third year. So maybe we'll start with Sal. Like, he's, you know, he's our senior here. He's, a, he's, <laughs> he's got seniority. How about you start? I'm pretty sure Yoki's older than me, too. That's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I, I've, I've had a, a, a really interesting experience, I think, because of the major I chose. Uh, the critical and cultural practices major, I, I think, destroys every other major at the <laughs> school in, in like the range of disciplines I can, I can jump into and play around with. Um, so I, I've, I've really tried to make an effort to, uh, to jump all around the school. I haven't played as much in design as I, I'd like to, and that might be the focus of my fourth year. Um, but it, it's it's been a really interesting time working with the curriculum that's been set out for students here, uh, especially with the uh, the unexpected, uh, well, for some unexpected uh, power that comes from the academic side uh, of this school, and, and just how much it can affect uh, not only the work you're producing but your awareness of your of your social and political positions at all times. Wow, that was a great answer. <laughs> I want to go back to school and take your program. Um, Denise, you're going to third year. How's your experience so far? Yeah, it's been great. Um, uh, I had a short foundation year because I had some transfer credits, so I had the opportunity to, ju to jump right into my major. Um, but uh, once you get into your major, I don't know if this is about the next question, if I'm ruining this, but... I allow you to speak of this now. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's, it's really great to be able to connect with uh, like-minded people in your own major, but um, you kind of lose sight of uh, what's happening um, in other areas. So um, yeah, I, I'm, right now I'm, I really enjoyed my own major, but now I'm trying to connect with the other people as well. Animation's very, it's a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> so like, but you know what? Um, apart from the cafeteria and the Aboriginal gathering place, the animation lab is the only place you can see the sea. Ah, oh. there you go, that's an incentive, yeah. yeah. Good. So that's why you guys never come out. No, we've got a beautiful <laughs> bridge view. So nice, <laughs> cool. Alia, how about you? How's uh, your first year been? Uh, it was really wild, but in like a great way. Like because I moved here from the Middle East, so it's a huge change. Not only that, I don't, I didn't have any family here. I didn't know anybody. I just decided to pursue like my the career that I wanted, and I think that I loved Foundation Year a lot because of what you've been talking about, meeting other people. Like I have a friend who really is really into um, like calligraphy and stuff, and I never thought that was something that was so like people get really into it and like fonts. Like he can talk about fonts all day, <laughs> and like that. Some people that's just like, ugh, fonts. But like that's interesting. It's awesome to meet people who have their niche and they're really passionate about it, and being around everyone else who's really passionate about their thing, and that's just really inspiring. And one thing that I 
take a lot from. I've taken a lot from for my foundation year. Yoki, how about you? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Um, well, as Sal mentioned, I am a little bit older than he is, but uh, so uh, as a result of that, I mean, I've had a little bit of a, a, different, um, a different experience in the school compared to uh, many people who are coming in fresh out of high school. Um, so speaking to anyone who finds themselves in a similar situation, I think um, having gotten involved with the Emily Carr Students' Union um, and any sort of um, other committees or social events or things of that nature has really helped me to uh, connect with a lot of the people within the school that I otherwise wouldn't have. It's, it's really easy to try and I don't know, feel a little bit uh, like you've outgrown uh, a certain experience, but um, it's been really good to uh, try and share what I've learned and still participate in as many ways as possible. So that's been a great avenue for me and I would encourage uh, even younger students to get involved as much as they can. Get involved, that's a good one. Get involved in your community. <laughs> we need people like these guys. We need a fresh batch. So you know, when you start, get involved in the awesome committee, go see the students union, come see me, I'll put you to work. You know, I'll find you th things to do. I always have free food in my office, so that's a. It's all, you know, kind of like, <laughs> I, I, that's how I get them in my office. Um, all right, and Joey, how about you? Yeah, um, I guess I kind of have a similar um, situation with Kyoki because I was older when I came into um, Emily Carr, but I found that it wasn't as hard as I thought to meet people and make friends because everybody is honestly so friendly and accepting. And with a smaller school, like you do get a more personal experience with everybody. And yeah, I just suggest everyone to volunteer for Student Union. Um, you also get a lot of free stuff, so that's a big incentive. And um, yeah, everyone's just great. Yes. Us old people can have fun, right? Yeah. Uh, not all, just the young people. OK, great. So that was the present part. So now moving on to uh, the future, so these guys. So do you guys have any advice, anything anything you wish you had known before you started, anything you know you you know, you, any any kind of little tips, little you know, secrets you want to reveal? Alia, oh, yeah. I see the wheels turning. <laughs> I'd say that um, one thing that I wish that I knew, uh, well, I, like one thing that I think is really important is that you, it's there's like an aggressive amount of change that's going to be happening. Like so many things are going on, like so many things are happening, and. It can be really overwhelming and you can be really scared, especially kind of when it comes to like how you make art, like especially because I just came out of high school, so I had a very like high school like idea of like what is art and how you make it. And all of that's just gonna be like <laughs> thrown out the window. You're gonna learn everything new, it's gonna be totally different, everything's gonna be you're gonna be confused and you're gonna be angry sometimes because everything you've learned up to this point is somewhat not complete. But that's also really like empowering because it's a whole all about like a fresh start. So I think that ac accepting this change with like aggressive positivity <laughs> is <laughs> just like say to yourself, I'm gonna be okay, and you're gonna be okay. So <laughs> I'd say that. So uh, I have I have uh, one piece of advice for inside your uh, your uh, your education and then also uh, community outside of it. Uh, inside of your education, I can highly advise that no matter how much you think you know walking into Emily Carr, your arrogance will not serve you well. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a really strong high school education. It was incredibly formally uh, powerful, uh, and it was uh, an intense four years of art history as well. Uh, and I, I came in thinking, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and learn the hard way that I really did not. Um, and it, it's, it's been a very humbling experience my, my past three years here. I've, I've been put into, uh, into situations where, yeah, sure, I could breeze through an assignment quickly, but I've also been put into uh, incredible ethical dilemmas via, via uh, little assignments and things like that as well. Uh, outside of it, the, the getting involved is actually incredibly important. I, um, 
Uh, I sit on the board of governors right now. I, I sit on the board of directors for the student union as well. Uh, and uh, it's given me an incredible understanding, not only of the school's operations, but why curriculum it is, is the way it is, why it's evolved into what it is. Uh, I, I've had a lot of questions answered just by uh, attending a great deal of the meetings about things like academic planning and their priorities. Uh, and uh, being involved in these things, and I'm sure Yoki can actually expand on this quite a bit uh, as well, is, is an incredible and uh, empowering experience. Um, yeah, certainly I would second that point. Um, uh, what I would like to, to add to that though is that uh, don't forget that the, the staff and, and faculty are, are here to help you. So if you ever feel stuck in any way, even if it's just, just for the smallest reason, don't be afraid to, to ask questions. They will more than likely be willing to, to support you in whatever way that you need. Um, and also your, your classmates um, as well. Um, if you need assistance, by all means, um, just ask. And even if people that, you're, that you don't know who are in second, third, or, or fourth year, uh, don't be afraid to make yourself uh, vulnerable um, in that way. Um, uh, because pretty much always it, it turns out for the better. So take that chance when you need it. Okay. Um, I guess I have two pieces of advice. The first is to, even though foundation year is a time for you to figure out what you want to do and experiment, do your best to take it seriously because your grades really matter, especially when you're trying to get into a more competitive um, department such as design. Um, just work hard and do your best, but still have fun. And then uh, my second piece of advice is if you're moving to Vancouver for um, um, your four years here, I would suggest moving close to a SkyTrain station and preferably um, in the city of Vancouver because I used to live um, around the Lougheed uh, town center area. It was border of Burnaby and Coquitlam. It took me an hour to get to school and it was terrible, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Um, it really takes a lot out of you when you have to travel back and forth, especially when you have these big projects that you're carrying. So really do um, try to find a place that's close to a SkyTrain, like close to Vancouver, um, or even like uh, anywhere along a bus route. That would really help a lot, yeah. Um, I've got two pieces of advice. Um, so first, Try to take as many different classes as you can in foundation year and be open to new stuff because when you go into your major, you're probably not gonna be able to do that. Um, I wish I experimented more in foundation year. Um, and second is get to know people. Um, if you're introverted, just pretend you're an extrovert <laughs> and go out there, introduce yourself to other people, um, make friends. Volunteer. Um, if you have a job opportunity coming up on campus, do that. Um, just try to be as social as you can because uh, one of the reasons you're coming to art school is connections and meeting people. So yeah, take advantage of that. Yeah, let yourself be known so then you can be on this panel next year. <laughs> I'll pick you. Okay, so now time for questions. So you've heard from the students. You you know you know what their departments are what their stories are. So we're gonna take questions. We have a microphone. April's gonna uh, walk around with the microphone. So if you have a question, raise your hand. April will go see you. It's very important that you wait for the microphone to get to you. It's so much fun holding a microphone. I love it so much. So please wait for the microphone because if you don't speak in the microphone, the live stream is just gonna be like crickets. So here we have a question right there. So let's start, break the ice. Oh, is it work? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm, I'm planning to go into interaction design, except I was wondering if it's possible to take classes outside of um, that field, because as far as, I'm, as I understand, UI design is to be very isolationist. I was wondering if we could take classes in, let's say, graphic design or other things. Should, it, should you, David, you, you, we could, Ooh. Dr. Bogan? I don't, are you, are we supposed to get Susan and Susan Stewart, Dr. Bogan? So um, when, uh, when you're looking at the different programs, one of the things about the design area is that it emphasizes the relationship between the different design disciplines. 
If you go on the website and you look at the way the, the major lays out, um, not only are you doing core courses in your field like interaction design or communication design, but you have opportunities for electives within the design area. So um, uh, unlike, uh, unlike uh, many other institutions where we really, uh, they really track people in the different design areas, you have those core studios, but you also have uh, thematic electives that are shared across the design areas and the opportunity to use additional credits uh, in other areas. I think you, you really do have to look at, and the students can probably speak to this, there are some programs that are more focused and require more time in the major. Animation would be one. I think you could confirm <laughs> 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 that that really does require a lot of time uh, uh, focused on the major. But in any of these fields, uh, you still have a number of electives that you can do in other areas, as well as academic courses that you do across the curriculum. More questions? Oh, oh, April, that's going to be tough. She's right in the middle. <laughs> Just throw it. <laughs> have a little musical interlude while the microphone gets passed. Oh, look at teamwork, yes, awesome. Um, I was just wondering if there's any um, like studio space or any space for you to work um, at the university or is it kind of just on yourself to work in your living place or find it yourself? Well, uh, there are a couple of different places that you can work depending on what you're working on. Uh, there are computer labs if you need to edit or animate or anything like that and there's also like a studio area for painting as well. It's mm -hmm. like a small little space but it, people uh, have lots of stuff in there. People get some pa uh, like painting and drawing done and there's also the shop that people mm -hmm. tend to work in. So there is not, like, I don't think there's a lot of space but there's definitely spaces that if you feel that you can't work at home, th there are opportunities I think. Paul wants to add to that? Uh, in fourth year, you get your own studio space here. Um, before that, it, it, it depends on where you are as well. Like if you're in printmaking, odds are you don't have a printing press at home. Uh, so all your work will be done in the studio there. Uh, and they give, you, they give you space for storage and things like that. Yeah, um, especially for foundation year, we do have designated areas just for people to kind of gather, get to know each other. There's especially um, the M lab, which is just reserved for foundation students. So it's a cool place to get to know people too. Also, the school is open un until uh, 11 p.m. So there's plenty of time to do your work. <laughs> Other questions? Ah, right at the front. Easy access, April. Yeah. Oh. Uh, what's the typical course load of a foundation student and how much time should I expect to be spending on campus on a weekly basis? There are days I have come in at like 7.30 in the morning and left at 1 a.m. Uh, during the extended <laughs> hours. Yeah, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, yeah, again, it depends on like what, what you're doing exactly. I'd say for the, um, the studio, like the media and like the main ones, like the media class, the visual arts and design ones, it just depends on you and what you do. But I mean, there, there are times, like especially do, like during the final projects and like exams coming where people stay till, till late. <laughs> but it's all, it all depends on you and your time management and how you, uh, w you work and how you function. Yeah, and just one, one add to that, it really, it amounts to um, if you want to be a B student or an A student. Um, so if, if you really want to get the best grades uh, and put in, put in the effort, then it, yeah, you would spend most of your time here pretty much. <laughs> um, but I mean, if you're, if you're fine with doing less, yeah, you could go home, but I mean, it's a pretty cool place, so. Yeah, it is going to seem like a lot at first, especially for this first semester, um, because you will have 15 credits worth of classes, so six for the core, um, six for the um, humanities, and then three for CP. So there are different workloads depending on the class and your instructor. Um, so it really depends also on um, how much time it takes for you to do those things as well. So it really depends on the person, yeah. Denise, do you know good places to crash on campus? <laughs> where, can, where can one sleep between classes? Oh, 
um, the media room. The, <laughs> there's a oh, really and she nice knows couch. she has some lined up. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a nice TV. You can order pizza. <laughs> there you go. You got it. Why would you want to leave? You've got everything here. <laughs> oh, there's also a room where you can nap in as well. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We yeah. have a sleeping yeah. room um, on the foundation yeah, yeah. corridor. <laughs> yeah. You have to be in the know. You have to know where it is. Yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> no questions. Oh, there you go. You too. Uh, in terms of living conditions, since Emily Carr doesn't really have their own de designated sleeping or housing areas, how do you guys help students find their living areas? Right, that would be me. Um, <laughs> yeah, we do have a housing assistant who's going to work this summer. So, oh, by the way, we have a welcome guide that's now up and running. So we have a beautiful welcome guide online with lots of information about you know, what you should do now, what you should prepare, and then orientation activities and all that good stuff. So we're going to give you a link to that. Um, but for housing, um, students typically will find their own apartments. We can help with that, whether it's like directing to the uh, good websites or like going through ads with them or talking about neighborhoods if you're not familiar with the neighborhoods, because that's a big obstacle like when you don't know the city at all it's like where like where to start so we can help you with that um, there's also the option of doing homestay I know a lot of students will go especially international students homestay is really great if you don't mind living in somebody else's house um, you basically get a room in a family in, in a family house but it's really great because somebody else finds it for you <laughs> so you don't have to pound the pavement and, and knock on doors and visit apartments somebody will place you. So that's a good option for, and you can just do it for a semester or for half a semester for however long as you want, but it's a nice way to, tr you know, just to not have to worry about that when you're coming in. Uh, and then you can do your search while you're here and find friends and, and look for roommates and all that stuff. But, uh, but yeah, we do have the housing assistant. We have a housing website and we, and it's hard. It's not fun finding housing. <laughs> We've all done it. It sucks. Uh, but you know, people always end up finding something, and then if you have problems, we can help you with that too. If like the place you find is no good, we can help you uh, with that. So, you know, start looking. I would say now, start looking at neighborhoods. Start looking at the places you would want to live. So that's going to help a lot. It's going to help kind of focus your search. So that's a good thing to do in the summer. And the the bulk of your search will happen probably if you're moving here. Are you moving here from from a different city or? He's just wondering in case, just for the live stream, I just got to say that. Um, so uh, what was I saying? Um, yeah, look at the neighborhoods. And then, the, yeah, the bulk of your search will happen probably in July, like starting June, maybe late June, July, because how it works typically is uh, people give their notice one month in advance. So apartments typically become available a month ahead. So people will give their notice in July if they're moving on July 1st, if they're moving out on August 1st. So keeping that in mind, you can not you can start looking now, but the bulk of the search will happen later, and then we'll have a housing assistant then, and I'll be there too, and we can help you, because we all want you to have a roof over your head. Because you can't, because the, the school closes at night, <laughs> so you can't live here. <laughs> there are ways around that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 didn't hear that? Mm -hmm. More questions? Um, does Emily Carr offer any job opportunities for first year students? Hmm. Anybody here works on campus? I do. Yeah, Beth does. Yeah. Um, I don't quite remember what I did in foundation year though. <laughs> oh, right. Um, okay. <laughs> I do remember. Um, I was um, taking notes uh, during the lectures, um, during the art history lectures, actually, for the disability oh, okay. services. Um, so that's an option. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of student monitor opportunities on campus. Um, right now, I'm uh, working at the mocap studio, um, but I've worked on um, National Portfolio Day, and sometimes there will be um, Senate elections. I will keep the ballots. Um, yeah. There are a lot of opportunities. Just keep an eye out. 
Yeah. The, uh, the students, you know, you'll have a chance in your foundation year to be ele elected to a position there. There's a small stipend that comes with, with uh, working for the board of directors there, but it, not nearly enough to pay your rent, but it's, it's something and it's handy. And typically, if you get a job on campus, is there are some like facilities will hire, the technicians will hire, um, the audiovisual department will hire. So the moment you get a job, that leads to more jobs. So if people know you as a reliable worker, then they'll they'll you know hunt you down to offer you more work. So you start, you'll get a few hours here and there, but then after that, the the offers will will come rolling in. More questions? Oh. Oh, one over there. Hi. Um, first question, can I ask two questions? Me? <laughs> two questions? Oh, mm, uh, can she? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so first one is, um, I was love searching up like, about the school and I saw like course selections, like course listing takes online or something. And I just, I was just wondering if I can get like tips on like to get better courses for like be setting up better timetables. Like, cause you guys have all done it at least once. <laughs> so I was just wondering if I can get any like tips or like, yeah. Tips for course selection? Course list thing. Like, like, oh. <laughs> um, okay, for the first semester, you won't really get to choose, I guess, the time. Um, you just um, rank which class, which uh, media, or which core you'd like um, from one to three, and then you'll be placed hopefully in number one or two in the next semester. And then um, everybody has to take the same humanities course, and everybody has to take a CP. So those are done for you. And then in the spring semester, um, that's when things get tough because that's when you have to get up at probably 6:30 <laughs> or six in the morning and wait until registration opens at like seven, right? And then press the button. <laughs> <laughs> you um, you have time to pre-select all your courses kind of on a um, wish list. And then when you press that button, it like, gets up to the system to choose the courses. And whatever you get is normally um, what you're kind of um, going to be uh, in for the semester. But you, there's also the option of doing a wait list afterwards. Some people might choose to drop out of courses. But um, the only real tip to get the courses that you want is to wake up early and to watch the clock. <laughs> yeah. So you want it's a, a good it's an art. It's a science. Yeah. yeah. Denise, did you have something to add to that? Oh yeah. Um, you want a good internet connection because the school's <laughs> yes. not open until yes. eight. Yep. It's all in the details, guys. It's all in the details. I've been through it six times now. Uh, registration is the most painful piece <laughs> of the beginning of the semester. I. Uh, you, uh, I, you're all being blessed with the fact that you don't have to register for your um, your first semester. We we had to when I was when I was a youngin. Uh, <laughs> Back in the day. Uh, but it, it when it comes to things like managing a timetable, it really depends on on what you're managing around. Like I'm I'm working two jobs. One of them's a night job, so I try to avoid jumping into classes that start at eight thirty in the morning. Uh, so that's that's gonna be your own business. And we have academic advisors on campus that you can talk to if you if you're wondering which courses to select or you know what times work best or whatnot. You can go talk to them, make an appointment, and they're super helpful. And also, just one more quick question about professors and faculty. Like, for having a class like with a very small size, you can you said you can have more convers one on one conversation with mm -hmm. those professors, like. But I was just wondering, do they like hang around at afternoon, like later, so you can like grab them and like <laughs> grab keep them teachers? there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, so you want to talk to your teachers, um, talk to your teachers outside of class? Yeah. That we have? Yeah. Something like that. Maybe Susan can answer that. Here, you can have my microphone. I can let go of it for like five minutes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, 
Yes, uh, no, they're not going to hang around in the afternoon. They're probably teaching another class uh, or doing their work. But uh, they do, every professor has office hours, and they post those that on your course syllabus, so you'll know exactly when. And a lot of the uh, professors will say, um, by appointment on their office hours, and all the professors will see you if you request to see them. You just have to arrange it. So you can email them or talk to them after class, and uh, they will do that. Yeah, that's a good tip. Uh, office hours. Go meet your teachers. Take the time to go meet them. They're there, sitting in their office. They're waiting for you, and that's a great way. If they know you, and you know them, that's just going to make your experience even better in the class. So take advantage of, your, uh, of those um, office hours, for sure. Any other questions? Anybody's? Uh, on that note about office hours, some of your teachers, like, don't, don't assume your teachers hate you. Uh, some of them have actually organized their offices in a way that's, that's really welcoming. For example, Trish Kelly, who came up and does the lectures, uh, I haven't been in her office for a while, but when I was in there in, in uh, second year of foundation year, uh, her books had been, had been organized by color so that you had something to look at. <laughs> they still are. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> staff that will be on hand out there and I just want to thank you all and thanks especially to our students who you know they're the reason we all come to work every day and we get to learn so much from all of you so thank you so much <laughs> great So uh, if we head out into the atrium, there'll be um, some tables there and you can ask staff or any of us questions. And I just want to also say that um, once you accept your offer, you'll receive another um, information email with links to the welcome guide and information about your registration and what the next steps are over the summer months. Thank you all so, so much for coming and we look forward to seeing you here uh, in September. Have a great night.